One of my favorite lines from Nishitani occurs towards the end of his book in Religion and Nothingness. It says something like, there is no salvation for oneself except through the salvation of all beings. And I think that really draws out kind of the soteriological significance of this idea of emptiness. There, there aren't any discrete individuals to save. There is only this web of interbecoming and fundamentally interconnected in a, in a sense, grounded on, on emptiness. Welcome to our conversation in process with Jared Morningstar. It's a special privilege to have Jared with me because I've admired him for years, even as he works with me and in a way for me. He's the operations assistant at the Cobb Institute and social media manager at the Center for Process Studies. Hailing from Stillwater, Minnesota, Jared is an independent academic specializing in 20th century religious philosophy, Islamic studies, and interfaith dialogue. He's now based in Madison, Wisconsin. He holds BAs in religion and in Scandinavian studies from Gustavus Adolphus College, where he graduated in the spring of 2018. I know Jared because he's so much fun to talk to. He has interest in and knowledge of Islam and modernity on the one hand and traditional Islamic thought on the other. And parallel to this, he's quite knowledgeable of Buddhist traditions in general and the Kyoto School of Japanese Buddhism in particular. And we'll be talking about all those things. Now, in addition to these academic pursuits, Jared enjoys hobbies of various sorts, photography, graphic design, and music. We may talk about music too, but one thing I can tell you for sure, he will interest you as he does me. Welcome. Jared, it's great to be with you. And I know that you're interested in religious pluralism, and I am too, but can you tell me how did that emerge for you? Were you born interested in religious pluralism or did it develop in some way? Tell us that story. Yeah, it, it was definitely a developmental trajectory for me. So no, not, not born into a religiously pluralistic family whatsoever. I grew up sort of culturally Lutheran is what we'd call it. So got the, the Easter and Christmas celebrations at church, certainly some Sunday school experience, but religion never really loomed very large uh, in my childhood. So it was only, only after kind of thinking through the topic a bit more thoroughly myself in my teen years that uh, I started to develop interest or affinity for the study of religions and the, the different religions that we have in our world. But at that time, uh, it was very much a negative interest uh, going through this, this kind of new atheist phase that was very in vogue uh, in this era of the early 2010s or so. And so that, that sort of shaped my, my early perspective on religion in a very negative light. And so in that perspective, there wasn't too much of a, a sort of distinction between different religions, with the exception, perhaps, of Buddhism. The, the new atheists tended to be much more tolerant towards Buddhism and even seeing some positive uh, aspects to, to this tradition with things like mindfulness meditation, which they saw as easily secularizable uh, into a, a wellness practice of sorts and things of, things of this type, uh, the, the more quietistic type of picture of Buddhist monks who are pursuing sort of individual and communal spirituality, but uh, certainly the Orientalist type of picture that these, these folks presented didn't show the kind of political uh, struggles that Buddhists certainly get into in, in their own uh, contexts, which are not fundamentally that different from some of the uh, religious struggles that you see in, in the West that uh, the new atheists particularly focused on in terms of uh, debates between science and religion and uh, women's rights, uh, things, like, things like this. So uh, as a result, I, I kind of developed a little bit of a interest in, in Buddhism. And it was through kind of diving a little bit more into that tradition that it, it sort of laid the foundation for me to eventually come to appreciate uh, the whole gamut of uh, religious traditions we, we have in our contemporary world. So yes, being able to see the the way that Buddhist spirituality functioned. And then uh, once I started more seriously studying 
other faith traditions in college, that's that's when I was sort of able to uh, really kind of shed some of those uh, new atheist kinds of uh, prejudices um, and uh, come to really appreciate both the the diversity, but the the unity also of the variety of religious traditions in the world. Well, let me ask you this. What was it about your early childhood? I take it it was nominally religious, but not a serious concern in your family life or the cultural setting. Did you nonetheless have a kind of philosophical bent to your life? Were you asking big questions? What led to the interest in Buddhism? I guess I'll put it that way. What was it in you that drew you to Buddhism, even though you had that secular, semi-secular background and that interest in the new atheism? Yeah, I think I think for me at that time, it was very much of a sort of existentialist sort um, of wanting to draw nearer to life and really feel deeply connected in sort of a non-value-ridden, non-judgmental kind of way with these moment-to-moment uh, experiences that uh, construct our 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 day-to-day lives. So Buddhism is a, a great tradition for uh, really emphasizing that nowness and uh, the, the sort of uh, even, even using this value language like beauty or goodness of the experiences that come to us. That's not quite right. It's, it's deeper than that somehow. But uh, for whatever reason, I, I felt very attached to that uh, in my sort of later teen years. Uh, Felt uh, felt like a, a way that I could grow into life uh, in in a more mature and kind of sophisticated way, and be very intentional about much of my engagement and actions, the paths that I was choosing, and yeah, then again, just uh, appreciating uh, what was what was immediately present. So, yeah, I. I I think it's sort of just a, the quirk of my my own biography and personality that that is really what drew me at that, that point in my life. But uh, yeah, it, it wasn't like some uh, big soul searching uh, type of quest I was on. Uh, I just found something that uh, was very interesting to me at that point. So I, I dove in. I really like your phrase, uh, drawing nearer to life. And growing into life, I believe you use both those expressions. And it's interesting to ask, what's at the heart of religion? And there may not be an answer to that, or there may be many answers, or the word religion may be a construct that's not especially helpful. But I do wonder if there's something in, in, in us that wants to draw nearer to life, close to life, a grow in life. I do think that's the way a process thinker like me might put it. It may take the form of drawing closer to God, but it may take other forms as well. But anyway, very, very interesting. Now you find yourself navigating religious pluralism. I've heard you use that expression. Tell me about navigation. What, what's at work there and what's to be navigated? Yeah, this is the the big question for sure, um, and one I think people people don't necessarily realize the the depth of this kind of engagement between traditions. So yeah, this is a topic that uh, I guess troubles me uh, at times, uh, but is also one that I find myself very drawn to. So religious exclusivism is certainly been the predominant mode of conceptualizing one's own tradition uh, against other traditions throughout history. And it maintains a significant prominence today, though there are more viable modes today. And and there have been uh, other perspectives throughout history too, albeit more more minority positions. But religious exclusivism, I I think, is uh, deeply untenable if you really kind of existentially encounter the sort of dilemmas of of pluralism. Uh, At at the base of it, religious exclusivism is my tradition is right and and your tradition is wrong. My tradition is right because it was revealed to me in the sources of my tradition that have absolute authority in some sense. But so could be the claim from any other religious position. 
And so it gets very difficult to have a, a sort of a holistic sort of meta perspective on, on these traditions that doesn't seem very, very flimsy, ultimately. You have to sort of have this uh, kernel of faith that your guys were right and, and the other folks were wrong. Uh, and then that very much colors how, how you view these others who are supposedly wrong uh, religiously. So these could then be folks that you consider as deeply misguided. Uh, they don't have the truth, but they have actually uh, religious teachings that are sort of error or falsehood or even sort of demonic in some sense. Uh, so this is not a, a good groundwork for understanding the value that other other folks can bring. And especially if you're in a situation where sort of all the parties are, are deeply entrenched in this sort of exclusivistic perspective, there's not going to be any grounds for kind of helpful dialogue. It's going to be sort of combative or defensive. And that's, a, that's not a good posture to adopt in our world where we do need to inhabit this space and our planet and communities with others. So yeah, the, the sort of pitfalls of uh, religious exclusivism uh, in, in light of this uh, topic of, of pluralism are really worrying because they are pretty entrenched. And so it's, it's difficult to, to get out of uh, this, this type of thinking. But on the other hand, I do feel like within all the traditions, there are resources for coming closer to, to folks of different spiritual persuasions in a, in a healthier, more appreciative kind of light. So uh, it's, not, it's not a lost cause, totally, but there is definitely a lot of work that needs to be done to, to really reconceptualize religious identities so that they aren't this triumphant uh, exclusivism of uh, my people are, are right and, and the rest of these folks, uh, who knows, uh, best case scenario, they're sort of irrelevant. Uh, worst case scenario, they are sort of dangerous heretics and also damned to a very unpleasant uh, final fate. And so there's myriad problems that uh, arise when, when that's your primary mode for understanding other people. One thing I've wondered, Jared, is if exclusivism, as you describe it, isn't most characteristic of revealed religions and maybe even particularly Abrahamic traditions. I don't know if it's as entrenched, say, in a Taoist sensibility or for that matter, a Confucian sensibility or maybe even certain Indian Hindu-like sensibilities. But one kind of exclusivism you see globally across the board is tribalism, which takes the forms of form of nationalism today. And so to your mind, is there a, a difference between tribal exclusivism, my tribe's the best tribe, and religious exclusivism? Are they kind of two sides of one coin? Any, any further exploration of that? Yeah, I definitely think they are connected phenomena. The term I would probably use for that type of tribal exclusivism is exceptionalism, which I think is really uh, very problematic, even among these more, more Dharmic or Eastern religions. And yes, uh, it does intertwine with uh, sort of nationalist uh, sentiments, uh, often, especially in the case of India. But uh, I think in the West, in the case of Buddhism, there's a lot of exceptionalism. In the West? Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. So Western Buddhists, I think, are particularly guilty of this posture of exceptionalism. Buddhism is not like other religions. It's a spirituality. It's just teachings about uh, the immediacy of life. It's not something you need to buy into with faith. It's uh, just practice, just neutral mindfulness. Uh, that uh, is, is good for you and, and uh, promotes well-being. So these, that's the type of rhetoric you'll, you'll see from these types of uh, Buddhist modernists, typically. And often this rhetoric then can be used to very sternly sort of dismiss other forms of religious life, religious community, religious practice as sort of primitive or superstitious or not compatible with modernity or modern life. 
But already this, this form of Buddhism that is presented by these types of Buddhist modernists is typically very novel. It is a type of Buddhist spirituality that has arisen rather recently. And if you look at the, the history of various uh, expressions of Buddhism in different geographic locations, boy, it sure looks like a religion. They got metaphysics, they got scriptures, they got religious authorities, they've had their own sorts of uh, religious conflicts, bloody even. Um, there is, uh, uh, there's Buddhist extremists even today uh, who uh, justify violent action specifically against those of other religions using their own sort of religious language and their own religious understandings. So there's always this danger, uh, even as I'd agree with you that uh, this, this sort of hard form of exclusivism is, is more of an Abrahamic phenomenon. But uh, even this kind of exceptionalism is, is pretty deeply dangerous. And uh, I think there are much healthier and uh, more spiritually nourishing perspectives we can take towards those of other faiths than this more kind of tepid, well, maybe they're not uh, damned, maybe they're not these total uh, disbeliever heretics, whatever. Um, but well, they don't, they don't have the real deal. They, they maybe have a, a little bit of spiritual truth, but uh, over here, my community, we, we, we have the real deal. So that, that's still a, a, a strong, strong grounds to, to be very dismissive, to be very enclosed within your own community, and especially in modernity or post-modernity, whatever we're in nowadays, uh, you can't escape the, the pluralism, uh, certainly not in very healthy ways, typically. So this posture is uh, ultimately not going to serve people well. So being able to more actively find wisdom and spiritual truths in other traditions that you can then turn and say, well, gosh, that uh, isn't something I'd found in my own tradition, or, oh, my, my tradition didn't emphasize this in, in the same way. And so I think there's that possibility of sort of genuine enrichment that, that can happen if we get beyond that uh, exceptionalist type of perspective. Yeah, that's, that's very helpful. Thank you. Let's turn to modernity then and unpack that. What, what do you have in mind when you speak of modernity? Yeah, million dollar question there uh, as well, for sure. So uh, right off the bat, I think one of the, the problems with this type of discourse is to create too, too strong of a narrative about what modernity is, especially without specifying sort of historic or geographic bounds. So I, I think it's very in vogue nowadays, especially in some of the more traditional religious online spaces that I frequent to to kind of have this grand narrative sort of against modernity and to, to conceptualize it in, in certain ways. But uh, there's often not as much historic study that, that goes into that and not as many caveats. So uh, here I, I very much side with a, a more uh, postmodern perspective and uh, want to, to be a little cautious or hesitant to create too, too strong of a Meta narrative about what modernity is, though I think there's still certain characterizations that that we can draw out as long as we are are careful to acknowledge that there are sort of multiple modernities. The modernity that's happening right now in Pakistan is quite different than the modernity that happened in 1800s Netherlands, though they do share some some common features. I'd say, but that said, I think some. Some of the, the relevant features here is, is certainly the, the pluralism that, that we find ourselves encountering. So no longer can communities sort of have their own enclosed space. So I think of, of traditional communities, even in places that were very cosmopolitan and diverse, uh, you would have sort of different quarters of the city that sort of belonged to different communities. So you'd have the Christian uh, quarter in something like Istanbul and the, the Muslim quarter. And uh, this, this type of pluralism is, I'd say, categorically different than, than what we encounter in, in our contemporary times, where 
no longer is the pluralism or diversity, these engagements of sort of different discrete groups with, with one another. But uh, nowadays, the way identities have, have sort of layered and proliferated, you have very complex individuals you're, you're engaging with. So you have someone who is uh, Hispanic and Muslim, and they uh, are a convert from Christianity. And then you have uh, a white Western Buddhist with uh, Russian ancestry, and uh, uh, he still sort of draws from that. And so these these types of people engaging in 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 such these different multifaceted ways, where there's sort of no core identity uh, in the same way that uh, religion, as well as ethnicity, uh, to an extent, uh, functioned as in in pre modern times. I think that's. That's one of the difficulties of, of pluralism in modernity. And I think we haven't sort of fully understood how to, how to conceptualize that. And we're still kind of stuck in, in this paradigm of conceiving of sort of others as, as this kind of monolithic category of uh, some other. Um, whereas now there's just so many different kinds and layers of identities that even a single person can participate in that uh, just having this kind of blanket category of other, I don't know if it does all the, all the work that we need conceptually. So I think stepping back from, again, that kind of very sweeping kind of language and being able to consider different pieces of identity separately, then yes, uh, of course, try and come to some kind of integrated vision. Uh, we don't want to stay totally in, in this kind of fragmentary perspective, but yeah, being able to touch on different parts of identity and not uh, not conceptualize others as as so other, but yeah, th- that's that's I think the the most relevant uh, aspect of modernity for for this discussion that immediately came to my mind. So some of what you just described sounded to me like what some postmodernists would want to lift up as definitive of our age. A fragmentation, the absence of solidified identities, the um, illusion of uh, stereotypes, the reality of hybridity, cultural, religious, you name it. Some say, oh, well, that's the postmodern sensibility. And by modernity, I, they may mean something different from that. But, but just to get straight with you, you would call that outcropping of the sense of fragmentation and the sheer multiplicity of unreifiable identities. You would call that modernity? I think it starts in in modernity, definitely. But yeah, certainly the the postmodern time we find ourselves in, if that's even still where we are. uh, (laughs) Probably not. not. (laughs) Right. I I, I would view that as as sort of an extension of of modernity. I wouldn't I wouldn't view it so much as this like total breakdown of uh, everything that was modern and something totally do, new and different. And I think that's also a, a pitfall that I occasionally see in, again, some of this kind of traditional religious online discourse. I uh, don't think you can draw these, these neat lines between modernity and postmodernity, and then certainly modern philosophers and, and postmodern philosophers. I think there's, there's some pretty obvious continuities there that at least I see. So I wouldn't I wouldn't want to to distinguish these things too hard, even as uh, yes, I, I generally agree this kind of fragmentary pluralism is m- more often labeled as uh, postmodern. And I think some of the the issues that we have with encountering that uh, stems from still being being stuck in a more typically modern perspective of using these big terms like other and uh, trying to trying to get to these sort of meta narratives and 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 such to to do a lot of work for us in uh, addressing a, a a diverse set of issues. I want to set the stage for a discussion of tradition in just a moment. But one more point about modernity: uh, I've been trying to learn about what is meant by modern Western literature in the early twentieth century, and so two figures would be T. S. Eliot and Ezra Pound. And Ezra Pound tried to write an epic poem uh, in the long tradition of epics. And he wrote one, but but it was was deeply fragmentary. And it had a sense that 
what you have is a potpourri of diverse happenings, not necessarily connected, all hybrid, and there was no overarching authority. And that was that was Ezra Pound. So that's very much in the period we call the modern period. But one defining characteristic of modern Western poetry was the theme, make it new. Make it new. Whatever you do, make it new. And could we add that to the pot of what we're going to mean by modernity slash post-modernity, both the sense of pluralism and the impulse to make it new? Is that something the self-described traditionalists are um, resisting? Take me into their world now. What, what are they battling? What are they fighting? Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. I'd say, yeah, the way I think of that uh, sort of idea of, of novelty really being upheld in modernity and or post-modernity, it, it's, it's sort of a, a deeper layer to, to this kind of narrative of progress that is also often very much uh, labeled as, as a distinct feature of modernity, especially. So certainly there's been many postmodern as well as traditionalist uh, authors who've critiqued this, this perspective of celebrating or worshiping even progress as this meta narrative and this uh, kind of end in itself that it can sort of fall into, especially with kind of scientific type of perspectives you get in modernity. But uh, I'd say, yeah, novelty. I like I like that conception better because it's a, it's a bit more value neutral, and I think it's it's very empirical as well. So whereas. Uh, you can look at these various kind of statistics and sort of all the, the wars that have happened. And it's like, okay, progress. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know. Uh, always like on the one hand, lifespans increasing. On the other hand, you can find all these examples of the ways that people have been dehumanized or even examples of genocide in, in modernity and even contemporary times. So progress, it, it gets very, you get into in difficult questions pretty quickly with that analysis. But novelty, certainly, there's so much newness that is cropping up all the time. And uh, it can be good and it can be bad. It can be good for some people and bad for other people. Good from some perspectives, bad from other perspectives. So in general, yes, I'd say that the traditionalists are resistant to upholding novelty as any kind of positive value. They want to, to locate the good and uh, harmony and uh, the proper order of human relations in traditional religious pasts. So there's an interesting line from the traditionalist author Sayyid Hussein Nasser, where he said that traditional societies were essentially good with incidental badness here and there, mm -hmm. whereas modern societies are essentially bad with incidental instances of, of goodness uh, here and there. That's pretty sharp. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it is, it is a, a pretty strong condemnation, in fact, of modern life. For our listeners' sake, when you say traditionalist, and you mentioned Nasser, and, and he's Muslim, do you have primarily Muslim traditionalists in mind? Or, or is that a broader term for you? It means Jewish traditionalists, Christian traditionalists? Buddhist traditionalists, um, Hindu traditionalists. Mm -hmm. Just give us a little concreteness to, to who you have in mind when you speak of traditionalists. Yeah, absolutely. So on the one hand, there is this sort of uh, specific academic school of philosophy, often called the traditionalist school, that uh, Saeed Hussein Nasser is certainly a, a representative of. So this is a, it's a philosophically robust religious school that I, on the one hand, they're great with pluralism for the most part. But is it, is it Islamic? Is it Muslim or, or not? It's, so it has a lot of roots in Islam, but it is not exclusively Islamic. So you have other traditionalist thinkers like the late uh, James Kutzinger, who was uh, Eastern Orthodox and did some, some really excellent work in that tradition. I think you have some Catholic traditionalists as well. But it's it's generally a you you could you could come to this philosophy sort of from any tradition uh, with some caveats because one of their major features is sort of this idea of the unity of the the world religions. Ultimately, these are all authentic revelations in some sense and real spiritual truth, and so you can 
sort of reach realization as a human being on any of these paths, and they will sort of satiate your, your spiritual needs. So what counts as a tradition, as a religious tradition? Um, so that's a little bit more of a complicated discussion. Certainly, there'd be forms of Protestant Christian religion that I don't think the traditionalists would consider as truly religious traditions in the way that they are using this, this term, because they, they have been very informed by certain modern philosophies, modern sensibilities, harder breaks from the, the previous tradition from which they developed. So I'd say traditionalism in this sense has a lot more of an impact in the Muslim world than the Western world, though I think that may be changing. There's a lot of interest in these authors online nowadays, uh, especially from young men who are exploring spirituality, but also looking for something that, that's deeper and connects them to sort of a civilizational identity, these sorts of things. Within the Muslim world, the traditionalists are not exactly well-received, but uh, certainly not by the Islamic orthodoxy generally, but they've still had a lot of influence, I'd say. And a lot of the sort of early traditionalist writers were Western converts to Islam. Now, why would they not be well-received? Yeah, very much because of religious exclusivist sensibilities within mainstream Islam. So these traditionalist authors are, are happy to, to say that there are sort of other means to salvation besides Islam. You can be a Christian and live a fully actual and activated religious life just as well as a, a Muslim can. And considering these are both Abrahamic traditions, they'd say that God will sort of receive these forms of piety without sort of discrimination. A Christian sort of properly performing their religion is uh, just as deserving of salvation in God's eyes as a, a Muslim would be. So I think if you look at the, the Quran specifically, you get this message from a number of verses, but the, the Orthodox tradition that developed has been less sort of religiously open in this, in this same way. Yeah, so so that's the the traditionalist school. I'm I'm using the term a bit more broadly here to just describe people who would kind of self-identify as traditional. And this is a phenomenon that I especially see among contemporary Catholics as well as contemporary Orthodox to to an extent and uh, not so much in the the Dharmic religions. Here and there I think you'll find someone. But yeah, it's it's this uh, this intentionally taking on this sort of traditional identity juxtaposed against a, a sort of a modern identity. Do you think that there's any sense that there's a revolt against history in traditionalism or against thinking historically? Here, here's what I mean. If, if I imagine myself inside the skin of a traditionalist, I think there's, that there's a trans-historical source of truth. I might speak of that as God or the one or the absolute, you know, what, whatever. And the name of the game is to receive truth from that transhistorical source and concretize that in individual and community life, which is what the, the, the world's traditions have been trying to do. So it's kind of like the, the truth is transhistorical and the paths are many. And so you can be open to diversity, but as long as you see it as resulting from access to a transhistorical truth. Whereas the, the real modern historicist, you know, sees everything, nothing is transhistorical. The Quran's not transhistorical. The Bible's not transhistorical. Everything is within the sweep of history. Is that part of the divide too? Is it a revolt against that historicizing of everything? Yeah, I'd, I'd say that's definitely an aspect that appears here. I think one of the hard problems, though, with this question is how do you, you're always going to, to receive historically instantiated forms of this revealed truth. And the traditionalists would agree that there are authentic and inauthentic forms of tradition. So not everything that self-labels as religious gets a pass. So the, the hard problem then is how do you make distinctions between these things? How do you know you're 
identifying the the right historical instantiation of this transhistorical truth. Certainly, scripture seems like a uncontroversial example here, but scripture is something that uh, is interpreted through the tradition, and the traditionalists would be ready to to acknowledge that point. They uh, would resist this this much more kind of Protestant tendency of the sort of individual and scripture being kind of the paradigm for the religious encounter with with truth and and revelation. But yeah, then then I mean, you get to this question of religious authority. Certainly, not every individual who's had religious authority in a given tradition across history has had a perfect perspective. They are not divinely inspired, certainly not all of them. Certain traditions may say, yes, that particular figures are. And so you get to a difficult place where, where's the ground then for for making this judgment? It's not rationality, not personal rationality, as that's a perspective that, again, the traditionalists want to sort of push back on both in terms of this philosophical school and generally this this traditional sensibility that I'm talking about here. So that's not it. So I think a lot of people end up in this situation where their their traditionalism is, is sort of very unconsciously driven and how they make these sort of interpretive distinctions is rather sort of philosophically feeble in in my mind. So I'm thinking here especially of very zealous young Catholic converts who identify strongly as traditionalists. And one of the most identifying features of these traditionalists is that they, at the very least, uh, tend to not hold Pope Francis in very high regard, or they sort of outright uh, deny his his authority. So, I mean, immediately you have a very strange paradox here that these people are identifying as deeply traditional Catholics. And one of their major features is the rejection of the Pope, which seems to me to be one of the, the major features of Catholicism here. So I think there's there's political and sort of sociocultural dimensions here that are kind of driving people to, to certain aesthetics. Uh, tradition, traditionalism has this really robust, noble, sort of civilizational kind of aesthetic to it. And for people feeling like they're kind of drowning in fragmentation and this myriad of novel forms that are projected out at them in our contemporary times, seems like a, a stable place to set up shop. But I would want to distinguish that from really kind of authentic, traditional religious piety, which to my mind doesn't need to sort of present itself as traditional. It's just religious. It's just the same sort of uh, stuff that the religious folks have, have been doing all along. It doesn't need to create this hard distinction between whatever we have now and uh, something that's traditional. So, uh, and I think from that standpoint, you're at a more dynamic place to engage with modernity in its myriad different forms. So is, is there a way to be religious that partakes of the best of tradition and the best of modernity? What do you think? I think so. I think it's a more difficult and nuanced process than the sort of online traditionalist types like to, to make it out to be where you just become traditional and you reject modernity. These are, these are their kind of slogans. So there's a lot of different stuff that can fit into both those categories there. And there's baggage on both sides, certainly. But I think you, you need a, a more discerning eye than, than those kind of big categories allow, allow you to have. So yeah, I think this is where thinkers like the Kyoto School and Henri Corbin are are really helpful for me because on the one hand, they are very traditional. The Kyoto School drawing significantly from uh, the Zen philosophical traditions, but also from Christianity. They are are not afraid to to cite the Bible, cite uh, St. Francis as exemplary of certain existential tendencies in, in the human condition. And on the other hand, they are also engaging with uh, much more modern philosophers, Nietzsche, Heidegger, 
Hegel. So whereas the traditionalists would, again, like uh, Said Hussein Nasser's quote, say that, yes, these modern thinkers are, they're essentially off track, but they might have some insights. So I, I think the, the Kyoto school is more charitable and are, are willing to take someone like Heidegger as a very important existential thinker, even as they view him as getting certain things wrong about how to conceptualize or actualize this idea of nothingness. Let's back up a little bit because some of our listeners won't know about the Kyoto School. Sure. Um, what you say can prompt them to want to know and, and to want to study that. So can you say a word about how you discovered the Kyoto School and what attracted you to it and um, what you think people should, should know at the outset so that they can learn more? Yeah, so I first encountered these Japanese philosophers in a, a Buddhist philosophy course in undergrad, and we read part of Keiji Nishitani's Religion and Nothingness, which is uh, sort of, I'd, I'd say, probably the magnum opus of, of this school of thinkers. So there's many other important texts as well, but this one probably gets the most airplay and deservedly so. So these are Japanese Buddhist thinkers, Zen practitioners, importantly. They are not just armchair philosophers. They are philosophizing uh, on the cushion as well mm -hmm. with these sort of traditional uh, meditation techniques and uh, other, other important rituals. They're drawing on, of course, uh, figures like Dogen and Basho, these important Zen thinkers, as well as uh, sort of further back Mahayana type of philosophers such as Nagarjuna. And so they're bringing this sort of rich Eastern Buddhist perspective, and then they are deeply engaging with the sort of existentialist uh, Western philosophy of the day, which uh, in this case is sort of early, mid 20th century. So you have Heidegger in here, you have Kierkegaard in here, um, especially. And so it, it's a very rich cross-cultural encounter. And I think they are able to uh, really do something novel. So whereas these truly traditionalist authors are kind of going to come from the perspective that all the religions kind of have a primordial perfection to them. Maybe we haven't, over the course of human history, gotten everything right interpretively. I think the Kyoto School is more willing to recognize sort of the kind of basic existentialist pitfalls of different forms of religion. So Nishitani in his text has a very eloquent discussion about historicity in Christianity versus in Buddhism, whereas in Christianity, things are deeply historical because Jesus was historical, a God in flesh, this event of the crucifixion and the resurrection. Wow, uh, this is a, a, a turning point of historical life. And uh, there's, there's certain insights that, that come out of that, but there's certain pitfalls uh, as well can get very, very caught in uh, these historical perspectives and get uh, taken away from sort of the immediacy of experience and uh, being able to sort of find spiritual revelation sort of anywhere, anytime through various medium. For the Christian, that's a little difficult because needs to be Jesus. Uh, it needs to be, uh, in a sense. Or at least there's the, there's the pull in Christianity. Whereas in Buddhism, there's sort of the opposite problem. It's a, a very trans-historical perspective. You have more of a, a cyclical view of time. So to sort of produce some novelty, um, to rise up against a tyrannical leader, these are, these are sort of foreign concepts in, in traditional Buddhist psychology. Things are kind of naturalized in, in a way that's sort of opposed to historicized. And so there's, there's pitfalls with that too. And so Nishitani sees sort of both those pitfalls and tries to bring these traditions together to get to something that uh, is, uh, I think he says something like the, the a historical ground of historicity or something like that. Uh, very paradoxical in his existentialist uh, Buddhist ways. So yeah, this, this overall method of being able to see faults even in tradition, 
I think is, is healthier, more helpful. And then the remedy to those faults is uh, not to try and retreat back to some golden age past within the tradition, but to bring traditions together and bring discerning philosophies into the, the conversation and uh, try to do, do the best to really uncover the truth of, of things with all the tools at our disposal in, in our contemporary times. So. There will be those, there are those who say, you know, it's all interesting, but I just can't see religion being grounded in something called absolute nothingness. I don't get it. What's empowering about that? What's salvific about that? What's nourishing about that? Can you speak to those people who have that question? Yeah, absolutely. So um, personally, I think the, the Kyoto School and, and Nishitani, they're, they're for a, a certain person, a certain person who has sort of deeply existential encounters with life and is, is looking for our, sort of the, the deepest possible answers to to some of these uh, questions, uh, metaphysical, ontological types of perspectives. So if that is not where you're drawn and you are, are sort of comfortable in, in your religiosity, I think that's probably fine. Uh, this is a, a very difficult uh, philosophical school. If you want to, to plumb the depths, certainly uh, go for it. But don't, don't feel uh, any, any less in, in tune with true religion or, or what, what not. I think this person is really saying, I want to hear what's to be heard. It, it's not, that doesn't make any sense to me. That's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. It's really, help me see how not having a thing, an entity, a teleology, a directivity, a something to hold on to, help me see how that can be rich and important. Not merely a matter of ontology, but a matter of soteriology. I think that's that's really the question back there. Yeah. Yeah. So Nishitani is is and uh, the other Kyoto school thinkers are creating a philosophy out of this Buddhist notion of, of shunyata or emptiness as it's often rendered. So they are trying to present a more robust concept of no thingness, nothingness than they view Western philosophy has been able to up to this point. So like process thinkers, they see a fault in our substance ontology, going back to Aristotle and earlier. And so emptiness, nothingness is sort of a, a corrective to this really basic concept in our Western philosophical canon. Importantly, I'd say Nishitani is a very relational thinker. So it's not that uh, what he's saying is that uh, everything is merely an illusion and nothing actually exists, but that uh, you, can't, you can't locate an essence within a thing, basically. So I think the Sanskrit Buddhist term is, is svabaha or something along those lines, uh, sort of like the self-existence, this self-reliance that these early Buddhist thinkers were debating. And so instead of having say, uh, a cat as, as defined by some essential catness within this, this creature. Nishitani would say that no, no such essential catness exists. But of course, there still is a cat. And this cat is, is uh, engaged in, in, in its environment in various ways. And everything in the environment equally has no uh, self-nature. Yet in their relationality, they, they do have existence. So you, you get sort of ideas of the Indra's net here, uh, where you have these beads all reflecting one another, yet the beads themselves have no, no image, it is only the reflection. So it, it's difficult to, to really give a, a full picture of sort of all the significance existentially and ontologically for Nishitani's uh, idea here and the Kyoto school more generally. But I think on a basic individual uh, human level, it really stresses the groundlessness of ourselves as sort of independent, autonomous selves and presents instead a picture of all things in fundamental interdependence. So one of my favorite lines from Nishitani occurs towards the end of his book in Religion and Nothingness. 
says something like, there is no salvation for oneself except through the salvation of all beings. And I think that really draws out kind of the soteriological significance of this idea of emptiness. There there aren't any discrete individuals to save. There is only this web of interbecoming and fundamentally interconnected in a a sense, grounded on on emptiness, uh, which allows things to become in, in different ways. So yeah, I, I think there's a lot of depth there if, if people want to, to dive in. There's certainly some, some resources I can recommend and put in the show notes here. So. Good. I hope you will. And I think one last thing or I'd like you to say something about before we draw this to a close is Henry Corbin. Can you locate him for us and say where he kind of fits into this discussion we've been having? Yeah, absolutely. So... I'd say Henri Corbin, he is similar to the Kyoto School in an important way in that he is also a a deeply cross-cultural philosopher. So whereas the Kyoto School was uh, engaging with Buddhism primarily and then bringing in Western sources, Henri Corbin is primarily engaging with Islam and uh, then bringing in some, some Western sources as well. So again, this kind of distinguishes him from this traditionalist school, which is uh, really exclusively rooted in sort of non-modern philosophy and trying to only only take as sources these traditional mystics and sacred texts and uh, and such. So Corban draws on phenomenology Heidegger a bit. Really, though, he is deeply enmeshed in the Neoplatonic tradition. And I think that is really what allows him to bridge Islam and Christianity, because that is a philosophical heritage sh- shared by these uh, two traditions. So here again is, is someone who is a bit more willing to critique the sort of established tradition, someone who has a more existential approach in general to religious life and sees that as the ultimate basis of authority more than just what has been passed down on uh, by tradition. So he's very interested in ideas of monotheism and kind of stretches them to their kind of breaking points in, in interesting ways. Uh, at the ground of his philosophy is the idea of imagination as this sort of important point in the Neoplatonic hierarchy. So whereas over time in the West, especially our, our hierarchy kind of degraded into a a twofold dualism of natural and supernatural. The sort of original conception of this hierarchy of being by these Neoplatonic authors had a a, a wide range of different levels of sort of angelic spheres and uh, subtle bodies and the the unity of God at the very top, but divine attributes uh, below that and such. So the the level that Corban really wants to draw on, though, is this imaginal level where forms are spiritualized and, and spirits are formalized, uh, something along those lines. So it's not the, the concrete world that uh, we experience in, in physicality, but it is likewise not the the realm of pure ideas that is totally formless and abstract. It is this in-between space, this uh, barzakh is the the Arabic word. He draws from this uh, great Sufi master, Ibn Arabi, a lot, along with numerous other Sufi and uh, Shi'i mystics who discuss this, this idea. So it creates this helpful bridge between the individual person and also historical time and these abstract spiritual levels. And this bridge helps uh, give, give an account that is, is a bit more robust and theophanic uh, is, is the term he really likes. So, yeah, I, I think that's, that's the very helpful idea in, in Corban. And then it connects so, so wonderfully to the arts and, and music as sources of spiritual inspiration. He has certainly a, a deep philosophy of, of art and aesthetics coming, coming out of this uh, perspective of, of the imagination. So yeah, certainly a lot of a lot of riches uh, there as well. So for you, if you have Corban on one side and the Kyoto School on another, do you sense uh, connections, or are they just two very different, beautiful orientations toward life, not needful of reconciliation, 
option? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, it's, it'd be a little bit tricky to, to try and fully reconcile them into to some kind of singular system, um, very much because of the issue of Platonism here. The Kyoto School is pretty adamantly anti-Platonist. There's not any hierarchies here. The idea of even some kind of separate spiritual realm is not, doesn't really fit in that philosophy. There's sort of being and, and nothingness, uh, certainly, but those are both immediately existentially available and in total interdependence. Uh, so you can't have being without nothingness and you can't have nothingness without being. But uh, any, any layers of reality further than that doesn't, doesn't really have a place in, in that system, at least how these authors uh, initially constructed it. But uh, certainly traditional Buddhism does have these ideas of different realms. So I think there might be resources there. But uh, on the other hand, I think both of these thinkers are, are, are doing something unique uh, and something valuable in, in a similar sort of functional way. So I think both of these orientations are deeply existential, but they're not existential in a purely atomized individualistic kind of way, which I think generally is more the flavor of uh, sort of 20th century European existentialism. And that's, it's a little problematic. You're, you're, you do have a difficult relationship with nihilism and, and nihility. Of course, these philosophers had their, their ways of getting around some of these issues, but I really like that both the Kyoto School and Henri Corbin are drawing on religious mysticism, certainly. And they are giving an account of hi history and historicism and uh, some of the sort of intellectual trends of our day that uh, I think are, are very insightful. So I think it's both existential and religious and philosophical in, in a really helpful combination of being able to deal with big intellectual problems, being able to to deal with the internal spiritual problems, but then also these biggest kind of problems of ultimate uh, human destiny and uh, salvation and such. A last word about uh, Whitehead, and it's really a question. You know, he's got this notion of a realm of pure potentialities, and they're real. We don't create them, we discover them. And he has a strong theory of imagination. Human experience is by no re means reducible to propositional formulations in the mind or, or sense experience. There's, there's a whole realm of the togetherness of the possible and the actual. And he's even quite open to actualities existing in non-three-dimensional space. And he's got this notion of God who holds the eternal objects together in a single mind. So all of this sounds a little bit like uh, something that would make sense to Henry Corbin. And yet he has this notion of a groundless ground of which all things are expressions. He calls it creativity, he doesn't call it God. It's not a thing among things, it's not a passive anything. You can't grab it, but it, it's everywhere, everythinging, <laughs> wherever there's anything. That sounds a bit like the Kyoto School. So, so I just wonder, but I, I hesitate there, too, because personally, I don't think they need to be reconciled. Let two things be good without having to be fit together. It's, it's, it's OK. But nonetheless, I, I do wonder if there's a way to say yes to it all in some kind of integrated way. But it sounds to me, Jared, like you're the one <laughs> that is on that journey. It, it's, it's really so remarkable. The worlds that you're living in now. What what's your future? Where do you hope to move? Oh. <laughs> yeah, I I I want to spend more time with both Corban and the Kyoto School, certainly, and uh, throw some Whitehead in the in the mix too, as well, certainly. So yeah, I, I think uh, there's yeah there's a lot of potential cross pollination between Corban's theology and process theology. I think. So that would be some very, very interesting work to, to do. Absolutely. Uh, and the Kyoto School as well, I think, yeah, it might be a little more, more complicated there. I, and in some ways, I think they already agree on, on so much. Uh, whereas uh, 
I think Corban's vision and Whitehead's vision, there's, there's a lot of contact points, but they end up doing very different things. Uh, so for, for Corban, importantly, each sort of individual religious believer is, uh, uh, has their own God, in a sense. And it's not that they've psychologically constructed uh, their own divinity. It's that through participation in the various names and attributes of God, which is what we're doing as created beings, those create uh, a certain basis in individuals for divinity to be actualized in unique ways. So each person is a potential unique expression of their own name of God in a, in a way. So it's very poetic. That almost sounds like theophanic existentialism. Yes, certainly. Yeah. I mean, each, each person has their theophanic potential, it sounds like. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I sure appreciate this conversation with you, and it's been so rich. Thank you for all that you're doing for the Cobb Institute, and thank you for what you're offering to the world in terms of your own ways of thinking. And let's point people towards your, is it a website, Aleph? Include that in the in the notes for this. I hope you will. Sure. Yeah, it's a it's an online Islamic studies publication. I I manage that uh, haven't been too active lately, but we did just publish a nice piece by my friend Abdullah Sattar on uh, sadness in Islamic oh, thought. Yeah. It's a shorter piece. It's more accessible. Uh, so if you're interested, uh, it's a it's a good read. So yes, yeah, so I'll, I'll put a put a link in the show notes. Certainly. All right. Well, thanks so much. Thank you, Jay. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Conversations in Process is a podcast from Open Horizons and the Cobb Institute, hosted by Jay McDaniel. If you enjoy these conversations and would like to support the show, consider becoming a friend of the Cobb Institute or making a donation at cobb.institute. Or leave a review through Apple Podcasts to help others find out about the show. Thank you for listening.